Hello everyone and welcome to our July WAMESA seminar. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge the Indigenous owners of the land I'm on today. So today I'm at Monash University in Victoria and our universities are on the land of the people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Indigenous Australians are the oldest continuous culture and they were the first Australian earth and environmental scientists. We've got a lot to learn from them and their deep knowledge of the Australian land and environment. The WAMESA seminar series is about showcasing the amazing work of women in earth and environmental science in Australasia. As well as the live seminars, we've also collated recordings from seminars that have been hosted by other organisations and we've put them up on our website and our YouTube channel so you can check them out there. The live series is the first Wednesday of every month, so the next one will be on August 4th. You can sign up as a member of WAMESA to get a notification of upcoming seminars or you can follow us on Twitter. Today's seminar is going to be presented by Dr. Tegan Blakey. Tegan is a research scientist in geology and geophysics and the team leader for basins at CSIRO. Her research focuses on integrating geophysical and geological data for mapping undercover and structural and tectonic analysis. Her recent work has focused extensively on Proterozoic Basin Systems in Northern Australia, and she is currently working on a range of regional scale interpretation and modelling projects in collaboration with the State Geological Surveys. So without further ado, Tegan, I will hand over to you. Thank you. Great, thanks Mel for that introduction and good afternoon everyone. Um, so today I'm gonna to be talking about some uh, interpretations of some aeromagnetic data that was recently acquired across the Tanami region and Northwest Aileron province. And this um, work as part of several collaborative projects uh, with the Northern Territory Geological Survey. Um, so I don't deserve all this, all the credit for this work. So Helen McFarlane, who's listed as a co-author here has um, contributed extensively to this as well. And I believe she's online um, as well to help out with the, uh, any questions uh, at the end of the talk. Uh, so before we get started, just a few acknowledgements, um, especially my collaborators at the Northern Territory Geological Survey. So Tanya, Barry, Joe um, and Dot, uh, who provided a lot of uh, geological input into this work and um, uh, reviewed, all, reviewed all the, uh, the data and everything. And also Mick was um, great at just compiling uh, all the geophysical data across the area and sort of packaging uh, that up for myself and Helen to use. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge contributions by um, Tanya at CSIRO, who's a GIS technician who sort of helped uh, pull a lot of the data together and Suzanne for her geological input into this work. Um, so geophysical data has enormous value in uh, covered terrains and is an effective tool for map production and structural analysis. Um, and it's really valuable um, in both covered and uncovered terrains because it can help connect and extend observations we might have from isolated outcrop or drill core um, from covered areas to areas uh, un uh, from uncovered areas to areas of cover. And Importantly, the interpretation can help provide context for other geoscientific studies, such as 3D modelling or numerical modelling uh, for fluid flow simulations, uh, for example. So just a bit of an overview um, of the, the project. Um, so this work stems from two collaborative projects we've had with the Northern Territory uh, Geological Survey. So the first one focused uh, largely on the Tanami region, uh, looking at processing uh, some newly acquired uh, 200 metre line spaced aeromag data, which is shown uh, in that, that blue square there. Um, sorry, I'm not sure if you can see my pointer. Let's get the laser up. Yeah, uh, this uh, outline here shows the extent of the new MAG survey. Uh, as part of that project, um, Helen and I have been working uh, on a solid ge geological and structural interpretation of that region and uh, having a look at any available petrophysical data through there to constrain it. We also did a little bit of forward modeling and interpretation of existing deep reflection seismic data across the area. So all that work was recently published and is freely available to download from the NTGS uh, if you're interested. Uh, the second part of this project focused more on the uh, Mount Peak uh, Crawford area. Um, again, looking at processing uh, some newly acquired aeromagnetic data and then working through any um, 
legacy open file industry data and reprocessing that as well to aid in the interpretation. And we've um, extended the interpretation we did in the Tanami uh, down towards the southeast. So really the overall aim of this work was to try and identify any um, inconsistencies in previous mapping, um, especially spanning across map sheet boundaries um, and try and develop a new cohesive structural framework for the region. Um, and this is really, I guess, a, a starting point that can help guide future mapping um, and exploration campaigns um, in the area. So the Tanami region uh, and the Northern Aileron province uh, are located in Northern Australia. And these areas are important because they preserve uh, an important record of basin development, uh, magmatism and deformation and metamorphism that are, that's been occurring along the margin of the North Australian Craton during the Proterozoic. The area is highly prospective for gold and preserves uh, several deposits, including uh, Cali, Tanami, granites and ground rush uh, in the Tanami region. Um, and there's also the home of bullion copper prospect in the Northern Aileron province. Um, so the boundaries between the, the Tanami region and the Aileron province um, uh, sort of not well defined. Um, basically the, the current definition is based on the outcrop extent of the dead bullet formation um, and the Wallawa gravity ridge. Uh, I'll show you my pointer here. Um, however, seismic data does suggest there's a major deep crustal uh, feature present near sort of the boundaries of these two provinces just shown in this image here. And that is coincident with the Wallawa gravity ridge and thickening of the crust from uh, 42 to 60 kilometers. Um, at surface, this boundary is not clearly um, manifested and it is draped by metasedimentary rocks of both regions considered to be stratigraphic equivalents. Um, and this image is pulled from uh, Golby et al. 2009. Um, apologies, I forgot to put the reference on there for that one. Um, so the stratigraphy in the area, um, I will show examples that sort of jump across the three terrains. So I'll just briefly run through um, the stratigraphy. In the Tanami region, uh, it's comprised of the Tanami group, largely iron rich siliciclastic um, minor chemical sedimentary rocks that have a lot of intercalated mafic uh, volcanics. Uh, this is overlain by the Ware group, uh, which is largely felsic volcanic rocks. Um, it can bright siliciclastics with minor mafic volcanics. Uh, in the Aileron province, uh, we've got the Lander rock uh, package that's equivalent to so the upper part of the Tanami group uh, and it comprises metasedimentary rocks largely of turbididic origin. Uh, in the Davenport province we've got the Uridigi and the Hatches Creek groups uh, consisting of siliciclastic sedimentary rocks and subaerial volcanics and then the whole area has been quite extensively um, intruded by granites um, in the Tanami region we've got the Grimwide Frederick and Birthday Suites and in uh, across in the Davenport province, we've got the Barrow Creek Granite Complex and Devil Suite. Uh, and the Grimwide Suite does extend across into the um, Aileron province as well. Uh, deformation across the area. There's a number of deformation events that have um, impacted these terrains. In the Tanami region, uh, these include the 1830 Tanami event involving um, folding green schist uh, to amphibolite passes metamorphism of the entire Tanami group. Um, they've had deposition of the, and the placement of the volcanics in the Ware group. Um, and followed by that, there's the Stafford event, which was a long lived um, extensional event punctuated by transient um, periods of shortening. Uh, the regional metamorphic conditions during this uh, event were typically green schist facies or lower, although sort of higher facies are noted um, in the contact areas of some of the intrusions. Uh, the northern Aileron province, largely again affected by the Stafford event. Um, in this area, we tend to observe tight to isoclinal folding um, and local high temperature, low pressure metamorphism, um, as well as widespread uh, magmatism. Uh, the Davenport event, uh, we largely see northwest, northeast, um, trending concentric upright folding. So the challenge of cover was well, not unique to um, this area, uh, but uh, it's certainly a uh, certainly made some of this work uh, particularly challenging. Uh, this map on the left shows the extent of um, outcrop uh, just in the, in the Tanami region um, with sort of similar 
outcrop coverage uh, extending to the east over Mount Peak. Um, so largely the units we're interested in and we're aiming to map uh, in this project are these, uh, these purple units here, the Proterozoic rocks of the Tanami group and Lander rock formation. And you can see the extent is really quite limited. Uh, there's a bit more outcrop associated with the Birindudu group overlying um, the Tanami region in the northeast here. Um, and this sort of sparse outcrop uh, where it is exposed, it can be quite weathered. It sort of created a lot of uncertainties, um, a lot of challenges in understanding the stratigraphy of the area. Um, so you can see this uh, strat chart on the right here shows several different um, interpretations of the uh, stratigraphy for the Tanami region. And one of the major points of sort of contention in this area is the position of this Mount Charles formation and where it sits in the stratigraphy. So some early interpretations had it sitting above the Ware group um, and some later interpretations have moved it to sit within uh, the um, dead bullock formation as a potential equivalent of that. Um, so this is just sort of one of the things we're aiming to test as part of this interpretation. Um, let's see if we can uh, in interpret the data and look at, look at any sort of structural constraints and see if we can place um, some of these units within the stratigraphy better. Um, so although there's significant cover across the area, uh, we're really fortunate in that there's some really great geophysical data. Um, so recently the NTGS acquired uh, some new aeromagnetic data over the, the Tanami and this survey comprised uh, two main blocks shown by this black outline, which were acquired at 200 meter line spacing. Um, there was some um, uh, 100 meter areas of 100 meter infill sponsored by industry also acquired um, as part of this work. I undertook um, some additional processing um, in addition to what was supplied by the contractor. So I did a little bit more noise removal, um, reduced to the, the reduce the data to the pole, or applied a whole suite of filters um, to help aid the interpretation. There's also a uh, really significant amount of industry uh, data available across this area. So as part of this work, we also reprocessed over 70 Aramag surveys that were acquired by industry. Um, uh, this was, uh, uh, I guess, quite a big uh, undertaking going back some of this data, data back to sort of the late 80s, early 90s. So there was some, um, uh, I guess, issues making sure that all the data was reprojected and reprocessed correctly. Um, but some, some of these, these surveys were, were really valuable in contributing to, to the data, uh, to the interpretation. Uh, similarly for uh, Mount Peak, uh, the NTGS acquired, um, again, another 200 meter line space survey with some areas of 100 meter infill. So I've done some additional processing on that. And we've also worked through um, the available industry data in the area as well. So if I just go uh, back one slide, all this data uh, for the Tanami region uh, is now um, available to uh, download through the NTGS if you're interested in it. So this is just an example of some of the processing and enhancements um, that we applied. So in addition to standard RTPs, um, vertical derivatives, uh, we've made a, a lot of suite of ternary images uh, for the magnetic data uh, and just a, a applied a whole suite of filters to really aid the interpretation. And this slide here uh, is really just trying to highlight the value of actually working through some of that legacy industry data. Um, on the left-hand side, uh, you can see this is the old 400 meter line spaced data and comparing that to the newly acquired 200 meter line spaced. Um, on the right-hand side, we've got, uh, this is just some of the industry surveys in the area, uh, quite over small smaller areas, but at 50 to 100 meter line space data. And you can really see the value that um, that has in some key areas in just highlighting some of the structural complexity um, of this area. So this is the uh, regional magnetic data across the entire interpretation area. Um, you can see a, sort of a few things stand out. You can see these beautiful fold interference patterns in the Davenport province. Uh, moving across into the Aileron province, getting a bit more sort of structural complexity. You can see these um, big northwest trending shear zones uh, in the Tanami region. Uh, you can see these um, circular to oblate shaped uh, intrusive granite surrounded by the magnetic stratigraphy of the um, dead bullet formation as part of the Tanami group. 
also looking at the gravity data here, uh, you can see standing out the gravity lows associated with some of those granites and surrounded by gravity highs related to the, the denser stratigraphy of the Tanami group. You can also see the prominent uh, Wallawa gravity ridge um, running east-west through the image here. So just going to jump straight to the final outputs and um, bring up this is the interpretation that uh, Helen and I produced. Um, and you can see there are some of the, the features I pointed out in the gravity and magnetic data. Uh, so lots of granite intrusion shown in the, the red and the orange. Some of these major uh, northwest trending uh, shear zones through here. And there's the um, uh, beautiful folds that we see in the Davenport province uh, in, the, um, in the east of the image here. Uh, so just having a closer look at the uh, interpretation in the Tanami region. So this one here is attributed with um, the, the fault kinematics compared to the mag here. Um, just as a, as a comparison to the previous work that was done um, in, this, in this region. Uh, so NTGS back in uh, the early 2000s, published in sort of 2005, 2006, uh, they did uh, some previous uh, solid geology interpretation in conjunction with their previous mapping campaigns. And this was recently compiled by Geoscience Australia um, into their Northern Australia interpretation. And you can just see just based on the new aeromagnetic data, the amount of detail that we've been able to, to pull out in terms of just mapping um, the major and minor uh, structures um, and picking out different lithologies across the, the area here. Um, as part of this work, we've also uh, not only done, so this interpretation on the right shows, uh, it's what we interpret as a near surface geology. So if you're gonna just strip off the cover, what's immediately underlying that. Uh, in the next image here, we've made an interpretation of um, some of the, the deeper units uh, within the region. So we've uh, stripped off the Birundudu Basin and interpret, interpreted the continuation of the Tanami group to the Northwest um, under the Birundudu group. Um, and we've also interpreted some um, deeper intrusives uh, down in the south here. So we've had a, a little bit of a look at the petrophysical data across the area. Um, there's uh, some of available. It's been useful in guiding the interpretation. Um, there is data available for most lithologies, but some units are more are better represented than others, and that's just um, a, a result of what industry has targeted in their drilling and what has had petrophysics acquired on it. So um, there's a lot of data for, for units, uh, for say the granite Swedes and say the Deb Bullock and the Killikili formation, less so for the Lander Rock formation. Um, so if we just have a look at the Grimwide suite, um, these are, I guess, petrophysical properties quite uh, typical of granites, um, see sort of density is around 2.6, 2.7, anything less than that is tends, tends to be um, really quite weathered sort of near surface um, uh, material. Uh, typically low magnetic susceptibility is observed for the Grimwide suite. Um, you can see here uh, on the right hand side, we've just got some outliers with quite high density. If you actually delve into the petrophysics data released, um, there are some more intermediate intrusives um, actually and also uh, mafix analyths that we see in the Frederick suite uh, that have been just incorporated and labeled as granites in the database. So it's just a lesson just to check. If you just get a petrophysical database, just check what things are attributed as, because um, uh, some of these outliers were really um, just, I guess, incorrectly labeled as um, granites here. So looking at the, um, uh, I guess the, the, mag the magnetic characteristics of the different intrusive suites I have um, mentioned earlier. So we've got the Grimwald suite typically defined by low magnetic and uh, quite a low gravity response. So these tend to be these really large um, oblate intrusions that we see um, and typically surrounded by the magnetic stratigraphy of the Tanami group. Uh, the Frederick suite stands out as much more magnetic, um, typically characterized by low gravity response, moderate to high magnetic response, typically has quite a uh, cross-hatched uh, texture associated with it. Uh, whereas the birthday suite, uh, which you can see up here in the uh, Northeast, uh, characterized by more low to moderate gravity 
um, and more of a, magnet, a moderate magnetic response as well. Uh, the Tanamite group, um, if we have a look at the Deb Bullock and the Mount Charles formations, these units comprise largely iron-rich siliciclastic uh, and minor chemical uh, sedimentary rocks. Um, and there's a lot of intercalated um, mafic volcanics in the sequence as well. Typically what we see in these formations is quite high magnetic susceptibilities and high, um, and high densities. Uh, they've got quite similar petrophysics, which does make them um, quite difficult to resolve. And we see that in the aeromagnetic data, they are um, difficult to distinguish from each other. Although I'll show in the next couple of slides, they've got a slightly different texture associated with them. Uh, the Kili Kili formation, um, largely comprised of siliciclastic sedimentary rocks. Uh, it tends to have a much lower mo to moderate magnetic susceptibility, um, typically lower density than the Deb Bullock and the Mount Charles formation. Um, occasionally you do see, uh, if it's been contact metamorphosed by a granite, it can exhibit a um, higher magnetic response. So this here just shows an uh, insert of part of the interpretation over the um, Kumari and Frankenia um, domes. And this is sort of highlighting uh, some of the different magnetic responses associated with the units of uh, the Tanami group. Uh, so I've already pointed out, you can see the, the, the gravity and the magnetic lows associated with these um, uh, two intrusions here. Uh, surrounding that, we've got the more magnetic stratigraphy of the Tanami group. Uh, so just where my cursor here is on the right, we've got um, uh, contact metamorphose, dead bullock formation. It sort of tends to be quite quite magnetic. On the left-hand side here, we've got uh, Mount Charles formation. And this um, these units correspond to where there is some outcrop to actually constrain what the lithologies are in this area. Um, they do exhibit I guess, quite similar responses, although the Mount Charles formation uh, tends to have a much sort of tighter magnetic fabric um, and can be a little bit more irregular in its magnetic response. Uh, whereas the Tanami group tends to have much sort of broader spaced um, uh, fabric associated with that. Taking a look at the, at the wear group, uh, here we've got the, uh, the Wilson and the Century formations. Um, these are just 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 uh, I guess isolated um, exposure of these units in the in the west here. Uh, you can see the Wilson formation is associated with this little magnetic feature here, uh, and the Century formation a little bit more subdued. Uh, it's possible there's not a huge amount of outcrop in this area. It's possibly they extend further undercover um, as indicated here, uh, but it's also possible that uh, some of these textures are just associated with the the regolith and some. Um, some sort of detrital material that's been shut off some of the, of the more magnetic units in this area contributing to the response of the regolith. In the Northeast, looking at the uh, some of the more volcanic packages uh, within the wear group. So these are largely uh, ignimbrites, um, volcanoclastic sandstones um, and some uh, felsic intrusions uh, that we see. Uh, these tend to be associated with um, is uh, the Nanigoat Volcanics. You can see this north-south trending linear mag high, uh, whereas the Mount Wenecke Formation and the Wenecke Granite Fire tend to be characterized by um, a sort of low to moderate magnetic response uh, with uh, sort of this quite distinctive sort of cross-hatched, slightly irregular texture um, associated with them. Yeah, uh, in central Mount Solitaire. So this image here kind of, cor it correlates with um, the inferred boundary between the Tanami region and the Aileron province is sort of largely indistinct at the surface. Uh, so in the north here, we've got the Kilikili formation uh, and in the south here, we've got uh, Land of Rock formation. Um, some isolated occurrences of outcrop of these formations, but the sort of it's got a relatively smooth transition uh, between these two, two units. Um, we can also see we've got the, uh, these linear magnetic features associated with the dead bullock formation uh, coming through here. Um, and um, some more irregular textures associated with some granites more in the south here. Um, but I think the, the important thing from this image here is that we, I guess, are seeing that transitional relationship between the Kilikili and the Lander Rock are uh, quite similar um, broad 
uh, smooth textures um, associated with the magnetics. Um, and this is because these two units are considered uh, to be correlatives of each other. Um, just having a look at the Billabong complex. So this is, um, there's uh, some isolated Archean outcrops within this uh, region, uh, but the actual complex itself is poorly defined. Uh, we've had a look at um, the, the mag data and uh, the location of uh, where those outcrops are. And from that, we have redefined the extent of um, the, the Billabong complex uh, to be associated with this sort of arcuate um, belt through here, surrounded by granites. Uh, the Billabong complex tends to be uh, characterized. It's got sort of more of a uh, linear fabric uh, to it. Moving across uh, into the Aileron province, uh, again, looking at the Lander Rock formation, you can see uh, in, in this mag image uh, on, on the top here, you've got that, that broad, smooth texture uh, as shown uh, a couple of slides ago, that's sort of characteristic of the Lander Rock Formation, but also what's coming out in this area are these um, uh, linear, uh, largely linear magnetic highs. Um, and so this is a bit of a question as to what these features actually are. Um, Potentially, they could be an equivalent or an extension of the dead bullock formation into the, the Aileron province. So potentially, are they associated with more um, iron-rich sedimentary rocks or perhaps some mafic, mafic um, uh, volcanics within the, within the sequence here? Um, this area is largely, uncover, un, uh, is largely covered, uh, so we actually don't really know what these units are. This is sort of a bit of a question that's come out of this interpretation um, that requires a little bit more follow-up work. So next I'm just going to um, go through a couple of key areas and just have a look at the uh, structural interpretations that Helen and I have uh, pulled together and also have a look at some of the um, modelling work that we've done. So looking at the Kumari and Frank Kenia Dome. So this image here is really highlighting um, the, some of the uh, isocline and folding um, that we see. So we tend to see uh, shown in red, the D1 folds tend to be quite tight isoclinal, quite often they're parallel to low angle um, thrust faults that we see. These have all been subsequently refolded during later deformation events. Um, so we can see our uh, F2 folds tend to be a bit more northeast orientated. These are overprinted by our uh, north-south to uh, northwest trending F3, um, more open folds. Uh, we see um, major northeast striking F5 synform uh, between uh, these two dome uh, granite intrusions here. And these are offset have been offset by later with west northwest and northwest striking uh, dextral and sinistral faults. Uh, this is a good example of one through here. In central Mount Solitaire, uh, we see um, again seeing that southward D1 tectonic vergence. So we've got some thrust faulting here uh, with parallel. Um, F1 isoclinal folds, again, multiple overprinting fold events observed uh, during later deformation events. Uh, so we can see uh, we've got some F2 folds coming through here. We've got our um, uh, northwest orientated, more open F3s. Three uh, is an example of one here. We also see quite abundant intrusions within uh, the, the fold hinges. Um, so we see these all across the, uh, the Tanami and the Aileron province. And we also see truncation of these folds along um, northeast uh, thrust faults and offset along uh, these west-northwest striking sinistral faults. Uh, There's an example of one through here. Uh, just comparing um, what we see in the Tanami, era, uh, Tanami region uh, in the Northern Territory, we've also had a look at some of the mag magnetic data in Western Australia where um, uh, I guess a bit more distally to, what, to the, the granites and having a look at the deformation patterns over there and um, uh, just seeing if some of our fold events correlate. Uh, so again, in uh, Western Australia, we see quite similar fold patterns, these tight isoclinal F1 folds. Um, 
Um, you can see it's the F2 folds uh, orientated in the, towards the northwest, uh, overprinted by north, north um, sorry, F, uh, F2 is orientated towards the northeast, overprinted by the F northwest trending F3 folds. Um, this example here shows nicely our um, F4 folds associated with sort of an east-west crenulation. We see we tend to see these folds preserved a bit more distally um, from the granites and then more broad open uh, F5 folds um, orientated towards the northeast, which are then truncated by um, later strike slip faulting, as you can see here on the right as well. So as part of this work, we did a couple of forward models against the gravity and magnetic data to try and test um, the interpretations of some of the, the faulting and the folding geometries um, that we uh, interpreted. Uh, these models uh, roughly coincide with um, seismic data acquired by GA back in 2005. Um, what we're aiming to do is just provide some further constraints on the fault architecture and the thickness of some of the units across here. Uh, we've retained some key horizons uh, in, in the model, such as the base of the dead bullock and the Killy Killy formation from the previous seismic interpretation. Um, as well as some of the major constructions, um, major structures, but we've made some um, site reinterpretations uh, where the magnetic data has sort of allowed for that. So this is uh, an example from the first model. So this um, spans the entire, largely the entire Tanami region from the Northwest down to the Southeast and crosses the boundary between the, uh, the Tanami and the Aileron province. Uh, you can see in the gravity data, these two prominent gravity lows associated with these uh, granite intrusions um, and uh, magnetic and gravity highs related to the uh, Tanami group stratigraphy surrounding those intrusions. Uh, so if I just jump to the next slide, which just blows that up um, so we can see it better. Um, I guess the main things I want to point out is the I guess the depth extent of some of these intrusions. Previous interpretations of this seismic data had them as a really um, flat kind of pancake geometry and uh, the modeling that's come out of this work shows that they probably likely have a much greater depth extent. Um, you can see the structural complexity particularly between these two domes here. Um, got this uh, broad scale uh, F5 sim form we see through here, but lots of thrust folding in between. We of course, I see this low angle thrust fault, which is just directed uh, out of this page sort of towards the south through here, uh, which we've interpreted. Um, and you can uh, sort of pick up these structures in the seismic data as well. Uh, a look at uh, so this model is orientated uh, from the uh, southwest towards the northeast. Um, this model was actually a little bit problematic to model because it's sort of sitting right in between these two granites and then we did have some sort of effects from those um, outside the, the, the plane of the model. So um, I'd say this is I guess far from ideal conditions for actually producing these sorts of models. Uh, but if we uh, just have a look at what we've got here and what we can see in the seismic um, data, particularly around the uh, Camarian Frankenia domes, where we picked up some low angle faults that can be seen in the in the seismic data, potential duplication of the stratigraphy. So here we've got the Mount Charles formation um, overlain by the Tanami group and then duplication of that again. Uh, and what this interpretation uh, was showing and from if I just go back to the previous one, uh, so this dark purple was the, the Mount Charles formation uh, based on the structural relationships that we've interpreted uh, um, here and from the MAG interpretation. Um, this is really supporting the Mount Charles formation sitting within the dead bullock. Um, sort of, uh, not at the base, completely sort of actually within the sequence. Um, and uh, I guess this supports the interpretation of that sitting there and not above the, the wear group as, um, uh, as suggested in some previous work. So this here just shows a, I guess, 3D rendering of the three sections uh, that we've um, produced. Uh, this is quite a complex 
thickly deformed area um, these are just sort of shown as uh, lumping packages together it's not meant to it's actually a lot more structurally complex than what is shown um, in this image but you can just see some of the major features here so we've got the boundary between the Alon province uh, and the Tanami region I uh, see the, the extent of uh, these intrusions here and just these low angle thrust bolts and that have been later overprinted by um, folding and faulting so just to I sum up the structural history just for the Tanami region, um, the first deformation event that we see um, associated with the 1830 Tanami event was forming those tight isoclinal folds, um, typically parallel to those low angle thrust, thrust faults, um, possibly associated with the southwest direct divergence. Um, and this uh, deformation tends to be associated with green schist to middle end fibrolite passes metamorphism. Uh, the D2 also associated with the Tanami event tends to be associated with more north northeast and northeast striking isoclinal folding. Um, again, associated with green schist and middle and fibrolite metamorphism. Um, this is potentially under northwest southeast directed shortening. Um, uh, this event was followed by deposition of the wear group at 1825 to 1810. Um, prior to uh, the Stafford event, which was sort of a largely uh, extensional event affecting the Tanami and the Aileron province, um, punctuated by um, probably short intermittent uh, shortening events. Uh, so uh, D3 in the Tanami, uh, Tanami region, we see development of um, these tight chevron style foldings. Um, uh, that tend to vary in strike between north, northeast, and northwest, um, developing under northeast, southwest shortening. Uh, D4, uh, those are those um, east, west trending chevron folds I pointed out, developed under north, south shortening. And D5 is when we start to see development of much longer wavelength uh, northeast trending open folds under gentle uh, northwest, southeast shortening. Uh, we then following D6 and 7, see more of a transition to brittle ductile deformation and development of some of those large uh, dextral and sinistral shear zones um, across the region. So jumping into the Aileron province, um, what we see is more uh, northwest, southeast, west, north, west, northwest, east, southeast, trending isoclinal fold folding. Uh, these developed um, in association with the initiation of uh, major northwest striking high strain zones. Um, this is followed by the sinistral reactivation of some of some major shear zones and development of a macro SC fabric. Um, these folds have been overprinted by uh, I think there's just an example up here. It's not sort of well, well shown in this image, but we do see across the Aileron province um, more long, long wavelength northeast, southwest trending um, open F3 folds. And then there again has been multiple generations of cross cutting uh, strike slip faulting through this region. Moving into the Davenport province, and you can see these um, large dome and basin style folding. Uh, fold interference patterns um, initially um, associated with northwest southeast striking um, F1 folds, uh, which developed during D1. Um, you can see deformation does become a lot more intense um, closer to the margins of the Aileron province in Osborne and the Crawford ranges. Um, here, the F1 folds tend to be more isoclinal um, than open. We also see uh, these folds associated with sinusoidal strike slip bolting along a series of anastomosing uh, shear zones, uh, which um, sort of trend yeah, up towards the, the Northwest. I uh, see a lot of drag folding um, associated with these shear zones as well. Uh, and D2 in the Davenport province is characterized by more open Northeast trending F2 folds, uh, which were formed under Northwest Southeast uh, shortening. So just trying to um, piece that that all together and piece together the structural framework across the entire region. Um, mentioned that Tanami, Tanami region, we've got D1 and 2 attributed to the uh, Tanami event in 1830 and D3 to 6 associated with the Stafford event. In the Northern Aileron province, um, so D1 to 3 would be um, equivalent to D3 to 6 in the Tanami region. Um, so that's associated with uh, again Stafford event in the Aileron province. 
um, and then some of those uh, younger, more brittle faulting events potentially occurring during the Yamba event and strange ways. Uh, in the Davenport province, uh, we see D1 and 2 is attributed to the Davenport event, but this uh, timing for this is actually very poorly constrained. Um, it could have pot potentially correlated with um, the sort of later stages of the, the Davenport, uh, the Stafford event. Uh, we have a minimum age constraint of 1707 based on uh, intr uh, some cross-cutting intrusions, which cross-cut stratigraphy in the area, um, but otherwise um, timing of this is not not well known. So really what we see across this quite broad area is diachronous sedimentation and deformation um, across these three provinces. Um, this is indicated by the, the new structural history that Helen and I have put together. And what this is, this is really reflecting changes in boundary forces along the margins of the North Australian Cranton. Really requires further metamorphic and geochronology um, studies um, to try and test some of these correlations. Uh, so just uh, some of the conclusions of this work um, is uh, this work does have implications for trying to understand some stratigraphic correlations and deformation across the area, uh, which can inform on the assembly of the North Australian Craton. Um, what this work is really aimed to do is provide a bit of a framework to test in future mapping and exploration across the region. Um, our interpretations are supporting the Mount Charles um, sitting actually within the Tanami group and not above it as some previous um, interpretation suggest. And also what we're seeing is quite a transitional relationship with the Tanami region and the Aileron province. Um, and we see that in, um, uh, it's observed from both the continuous geophysical response that we see between the Lander Rock and the Killikili formation. Um, and these units are also thought to be uh, correlatives based on uh, detrital zircon populations. Um, and we also see that these units of uh, quite comparable age are draping that terrain boundary uh, between the Tanami and the Aileron. Um, we do sort of recognise our magnetic unit within the Lander Rock Formation. Um, it sort of requires a lot more follow-up work, but sort of one of our thoughts is that it's potentially an equivalent unit of the dead port formation in the Tanami region, uh, which may be sort of further evidence of um, the connection of these two terrains um, prior to deposition of these um, packages. So this work has, um, as I mentioned, it's sort of aimed to provide a bit of a framework for sort of some follow-up um, mapping and sort of future studies across the area. It is quite a large area, it's mostly undercover. Um, Geophysics provides some context, uh, but it sort of can't solve all the problems in this area. And there's still sort of many questions to solve. Uh, one of those I mentioned is what is the magnetic unit in the Lander Rock Formation? Um, and if it's a dead bullet formation equivalent, um, is this supportive of the two boundaries being joined prior to deposition of these units? Um, sort of another, another question we had is, um, I guess given that the land rock is uh, thought to be equivalent to the Killikili formation, um, it should potentially preserve evidence of both phases of deformation attributed to the Tanami event. Um, but sort of what we're seeing, those sort of numerous fold overprinting and interference patterns that we're observing in the Tanami area, we don't see that so much in the Aileron province. They tend to be increasingly sparse. Um, so that's, I guess, a little bit contradictory why, you know, if these terrains were joined, um, why we don't see evidence of the Tanami event in the Aileron province. Um, so there's still some more, more work to be done on this and more questions to be answered. Um, so if you're interested in any of this work or want to get your hands on any of the interpretations or any of the reprocessed geophysical data, um, the work from the first, the first project, the Tanami project, this has um, already been released. So there's quite a comprehensive report um, a GIS data package, um, all the processed geophysical data, um, that's all available um, to access and download from the uh, GEMIS, the NTGS, um, and the data for Mount Peak is just going through its sort of final um, QA and data checks and should hopefully be available in the sort of coming month or so as well. So just keep an eye out for that if you're interested. Uh, so thank you for listening. Uh, if you've got any questions, happy to hear them.
Thanks so much, Tegan. What an incredible amount of such detailed work that you and Helen and the team have uh, have produced. It's just, yeah, super incredible. Uh, so we'll, we'll go to questions now and you have the option of typing those into the chat or you can um, unmute yourselves and just yell out um, and that would be fine too. So I've already had one come through on the chat from Louisa. Um, she said, said it's an incredible amount of work. Thank you for the presentation. Can you tell us more about your initial approach to interpretation? So that is, did you use the previous mapping as a base and improve on it or start completely from scratch or use any machine learning interpretation or things like that? Um, pretty much started from scratch. Uh, so where well, we took the existing um, existing mapping across the area. So any any constraints from outcrop, um, we, we basically pulled that out, removed all the cover. So we just had those isolated outcrops to grow the interpretation from. Um, obviously we looked at the previous work through there and used that to, to guide our interpretations, but really the, the newly acquired um, data, I guess, has has changed the interpretations that we see in some areas. Um, it's really sort of brought out a lot more detail. Um, so really we sort of wanted to come up with our own independent interpretation and not be, I guess, too influenced by what had been done previously. So, so we, yeah, la largely we took what the sort of really hard constraints were that we couldn't change, which was observations from outcrop, um, and then grew the geophysical interpretation from there. Awesome. What a huge job. Um, so if we have any more questions, feel free to pop those into the chat. Um, I'm really interested in, you know, I know when I'm doing structural work myself, there are some things that some areas in a field area that I'm more sure about and some areas where I'm less sure about. Um, and then I kind of wait when I'm writing up about the sort of the structural data, I kind of weight my what I say according to the areas where I'm more confident. Do you do this a similar sort of thing or um, with with geophysical data? Do you um, use sort of areas where there are areas where you're more confident and less confident, or um, is it usually a pretty good signal across the whole region? Um. No, I mean, there's definitely areas that we're more confident than others. Um, and there's definitely areas where the data quality um, is better, either because the rocks are shallower or there might be some high resolution industry data that better um, shows some of the overprinting relationships. So um, sometimes if we're a little bit uncertain in some areas about what the relationships are, you know, we can't just look at sort of one area, we've got to look at the whole region um, and try and work out those relationships. And that's the advantage, I guess, of doing these regional scale interpretations is that you can, um, if you can't see something in this area, you can sort of look at other key localities and just see if you can pick out what a particular overprinting relationship might be um, and expand that across. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool, that makes sense. I was um, while well, waiting to see if anyone else has any questions. I was also um, this is quite a self-serving <laughs> question. But, um, I noticed you noticed uh, you, you pulled out the, the macro SD fabric, which yep. I always love when um, you know you get that in geophysical data that you know macro the macro sort of sigma class and things like that. Um, but I had a question in a presentation I did a while ago. Someone asked, "Do you see C prime?" C prime shear bands at all scales. So I was wondering if you ever had seen C prime shear bands um, at you know the, these kilometer sort of scales. Your or maybe Helen has or um, not not in this data set. I think um, I think there might be some um, examples in the the Gola. Um, I'm sure Pete's probably the person to, to ask that question. I think he's probably got some examples of that. Yeah. Yeah, cool. All right, yep. I'll do that. I will ask him. Yeah, we always talk about the um, scale invariance of structural geology. So you imagine these sorts of things occur on all scales, but um, yeah, we'd be interested to see it with my own eyes for sure. <laughs> Were you, are you continuing working in this region? Um, yeah, I think it's the uh, we sort of need to work with the NTGS um, a little a little bit further, and as um, hopefully they'll in the next sort of year next few years they'll look at going back and sort of remapping, um, doing some further work in there. So hopefully we can work with them um, on that and trying to integrate some of our structural interpretations with some more studies on um, 
especially looking a bit more a bit more detail at the metamorphic history um, across the Aylorn province. So hopefully we can continue to work with them um, yeah. in refining some of these interpretations and getting a few more geological constraints and really um, trying to bring it all together because this is really, I guess, a bit of an initial initial study to sort of set up that framework for future work. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's sort of uh, sitting a little bit at the side at the moment, but then hopefully in the future there'll be a bit more work done. Yeah. Absolutely. I've got a question from Steve Sullivan. Um, he asks, any thoughts on the mineralization potential of the region? Yeah, so um, I guess recognition of, I guess, the extension of the dead board formation um, more towards the uh, the southeast and potentially expanding into the Aileron province, it does, uh, could open up some new regions for gold exploration. Um, it's, uh, I mean, the gold is tricky in this area because it tends to be hosted um, in everything. Um, and then just more, more associated with perhaps some of the major structures. Um, but I think I think there is that potential to sort of expand that, um, uh, expand the potential for gold mineralization across the, the northern part of the Aylorn province. That's cool. Very exciting, exciting stuff. Awesome. Um, okay. Cool. If there weren't any more questions, we might wrap up there. Um, yep, so it looks like we're good. Thank you so much, Tegan, for an amazing talk and insight into this uh, this um, incredibly detailed work. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed the talk and I can see the audience did too. So thanks very much. Thanks for the invitation, Mel. Pleasure. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Thanks. Are we having an EPMG meeting now? Yeah, I should have okay. sent the reminder out, but I didn't. Um, <laughs> maybe okay. I'll do that now. It's not too awesome. late. <laughs> See you downstairs in a minute. Bye. Bye. <laughs>